Hey everybody, what's up? My name is Brad Hussey, and this is the art, business, and craft of web design. And today we're gonna to be jumping into a new lesson called typography, or rather an introduction to typography on the web. Let's do this. Once again, my name is Brad Hussey, and this is a free web design course that I'm offering for you here on the YouTubes. And we're going to be talking about in this lesson, typography on the web, what you need to know. There's a lot to know about typography. So let's just jump in. What is typography? Well, typography, uh, according to Ellen Lupton, this is a nice creative way of putting it. Typography is what language looks like quite literally the words and letters you see on pages, fonts, type, text, stuff you read, that's typography. And in order to understand kind of where it came from, we're going to have to go back just a little bit in history. And I'm not going to bore you with this. I'm going to keep it really, really simple. So a brief history of typography, it really kind of started with the printing press. The printing press invented, I don't know, 1440-ish. And the first book to be printed was a Bible, the Gutenberg Bible. I might be pronouncing that wrong, but it is what it is, okay? And the typeface that was used in the Gutenberg Bible when it was printed on the printing press was a handwritten script style um, font or typeface of the medieval age religious writing. So literally when you know monks would would transcribe and write out um, medieval text or religious text, like scripture and the gospels and so on and so forth, they would write in this style of font. They were so good at writing and, and artistry. This is the style that they would use. So they use that style of writing in the printing press. And now we know this font as black letter or Gothic. It's a script style font. Looks like this looks pretty, you know, Gothic and medieval looking. And we wouldn't really use this un unless it was a, for a very specific style or, or vibe that we were going for. So let's take a look at how typefaces or fonts kind of evolved over time. So we got the printing press in the 15th century. It's a script style font. So old English script style, Gothic black letter looked something like this first one here. And then as, uh, the printing press became more popular and we started printing more stuff as humans, old style, serif style fonts. We'll get into what serif is also here in this lesson, but old style kind of looked a little bit like this. And then it would evolve a little bit more refined, just kind of a, there's, I mean, then there's lots of different fonts and typefaces out there, but this is just kind of visually how it changed. So we got that really intense Gothic monotype style, um, old English old style and then serif. So it's a bit more refined. And then we started to get into 18th, 19th century, kind of modern, kind of modern versions of the, of what would be called kind of display style fonts. So it's kind of a serif font, but not quite. It's a little bit more, you know, modernized. And so we would call that like a display style font. You start to see that more in television and screens before we started really getting into the devices that we have today, like computers and such, but you know, we're starting to get into what that would become. And then you got more display style fonts that now that we got access to computers and screens and, um, as kind of, once you started getting into the 1950s and the sixties, just the, the style that was that that was kind of happening was was a little bit more quirky and so you'd start to see these display style fonts which kind of bled into the sans serif font without like the accents and the and the all the the funny looking squiggly things and we'll dig into that so that's kind of how typography evolved now we also have access to all these old fonts and and there are uses uh, where we would use that but you can see here how it evolved over time. So let's do some typography principles here. Um, and these are important to know because the more you understand these principles, the more, uh, the better you're going to be at choosing fonts. So the whole point of this, you know, why should we know a history of typography? Why should we understand, um, like the, 
the the principles and the types of fonts and typefaces and history why do we need to know that as web designers well because a lot of web designers don't really know they just pick a font that looks pretty or cool or intense or epic or whatever they feel they base off of their feelings and then they just slap it on a screen and bobs your uncle no idea why that's a good choice why it's a bad choice what it's communicating and how it's being experienced on the other side so that's why we need to dig into this stuff so let's go into some principles here. The anatomy of typography, let's look at this word here, typography. And I've kind of broken it down here to understand how the actual font is broken up, the anatomy, kind of like this is my arm. Here's an arm, here's a hand, here are the fingers, here are eyebrows, eyeballs, mouth, the hip bone connects to the such and such, you get the idea. So we're going to do that with typography here. So the word typography, the top line here is called the cap height. It's the, the kind of like, just imagine like a cap on your head. That's the cap of, of the, of the word, of the letter, of the type. And then below that kind of like, so this is your capital letter. So think of cap capital letter. It's the cap, it's the top. And the X height would be the next line down here. And that is kind of the, the I, I suppose you could call it like the X axis, but it's kind of a, where these lowercase letters, the top of these lowercase letters, that would be the X height. Now X height can, with different fonts, they would have a different distance between the cap and the X height. Now, do you really need to know this stuff as web designers? Not really. You can use nice fonts and have the idea of, of what a good type choice is without really understanding the cap height and the measurements between. So I'm not going to spend too much time here because it doesn't really matter that much, but it makes you sound really cool when you know what the cap height versus the X height is and what an ascender is, so on and so forth. So the next line would be the baseline. That's the bottom. That's, that's the boom, 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 baseline. Boom, baseline. In the type, it's kind of at the bottom of the capitals here, but you can see that there are things that go below that and there are above the X height things that go above it. So those would be called the the the, the lines or the pieces of the of the letter that go above the X height are the ascenders. They ascend above the X height and even in some cases above the cap. And then the descender are things like the end of a P or, or a G here or a Y that kind of swoop down below the baseline. And that's called a descender. Now a serif are these little like, I don't know, foundations, little things that you will see on like P's or H's or, you know, even on this R, this little whoopie, whoop de doo thing and the Y, whoop de doo on the T, these little sections. On the bottom, that little flat kind of base section, that those are called serifs. And you'll know the difference between a serif and a sans serif, which is the next word I'm teaching you, like this. So this is a serif style font, and this is a sans serif style font. You could see the S here has a serif on it. It's like a little whoop de doo okay? That's what it is. Um, the I, see how it's like whoop de doo right? There's probably technical terms for this and you like typophiles. I don't even know if that's a word. People who are like type type snobs, probably going to be just up turning your nose on me on this one. <laughs> so they're called whoop de doos Okay. So this F has got a nice whoop and a de-do. So on the ascender, whoop. On the descender, a de-do. Okay. The S here on the sans serif, it's much more blocky, clean, um, works really well, specifically when would you use a serif versus a sans serif. Serif works well in a number of cases, but typically in books. Like if you're reading a book, a sans or a serif style font looks really nice on print. Sans serif looks good on screen. There are exceptions to that, but that's kind of a kind of a rule of thumb. But you can see the sans serif doesn't have any whoop de doos so there we go. Now the next thing in the anatomy are font weights or the weight of the typeface. Okay, so you can see here from this word weight, you can see it clearly gets heavier. You would probably know this as bold, not bold. There's actually more than just on and off, bold and not bold. There's actually a, a bit of a spectrum of font weights and some fonts 
have more availability in font weight and some don't. Some are just on or off, bold, not bold. But more sophisticated fonts uh, would have uh, a wider array of font weights. So in this case, the font I'm using in this is, let's pull it up and find out, Avenir Next, okay? And you can see we've got everything from regular all the way up to heavy. But actually regular is kind of a middle ground. Ultra light is the lightest in this specific font. And then regular is next, medium, demi bold, bold, heavy, or black. Uh, would be kind of another way, bold, black, or bold, heavy. So if you're looking at it from a CSS, cascading style sheets, that's when you start getting into like designing for the web uh, and coding this up. Ultra light would be like font weight 100. All the way up to black or heavy would be font weight 900. Not a coding class right now, but that's kind of how you'd interpret font weights in different types, uh, typefaces on the web. So. More, more understanding principles of, of fonts and typography, pairing. So this is like combinations. So pairing them together, kind of like wine and cheese, scotch and chocolate. Didn't, I bet you didn't know that that was a combination. Dark chocolate, real nice with a single malt that's got a little bit of uh, smoky to it. Dark chocolate, real nice. Um, beer and fish combinations, pairing them up. Do you serve red wine with more red wine? Maybe, but that's not a pair. That's just drinking too much. Get the idea? So you want things that accent and provide kind of um, uh, like a nice pair. So you can do that in typography as well. So on your website or your documents, or your books, whatever, but let's say on your websites, you can use just a single font. Keep it real clean, real simple. But two gets more interesting and it creates more visual interest. Now, if you start getting to three font choices or more, unless that's a really specific artistic choice that's actually, that actually works and you're more of a, an advanced or sophisticated um, designer, it's probably not a good choice. And it's usually the sign of a rookie. Um, I've done websites and work and designs that have more than three fonts and it can get hairy. Uh, but if it's an intentional choice and, choice and it actually works in certain exceptions, great, you can do that. But if, you, if, you're, if you're new to typography and you wanna keep your websites clean or you wanna keep your clients' websites clean and not too um, on the edge, two font choices. And I'll show you how you, can, how you can use that, how you could pair them. Also, you can create contrast. When you pair things, you can create contrast with different pairings. So you can create hierarchy, headings, subheadings, body, copy, uh, quotes, you know, block quotes when you're quoting somebody, um, you know, footnotes, footers. These are all, this is hierarchy. And you can create that with different pairings of fonts, font styles, font weights, and we'll, we'll, I'll show you some examples. Let's just do it. So here's a sans serif heading, that which is pretty heavy in its font weight with a sans serif body. S sorry, with a serif body. I, I better fix that. So there we go. Sans serif heading, serif body. A serif heading with a sans serif body. You can see that these pairs work quite well. On websites, I recommend doing something like this. Choosing, are your headings going to be sans serif or are they going to be serif? Depending on what you choose, your body copy should be the opposite. It just has a nicer balance. And maybe I'll pull up some websites and we'll see what happens. See what, the, what those designers chose. So there we go. Here's another example. A heavy you can you can use serif style across the board if you want more of a sophisticated style. But to create contrast and have a nice pair, a heavy font weight with a light font weight for the body. So heavy font weight header light font weight body. A heavy font weight heading and a light font weight 
body. See? Here's another example. We can play around with capitalization. So we got a sans serif capitalized heading, which is heavy in its font weight. Now we've got a subheading, which is also capitalized, but it's light font weight, lighter color, contra less contrast here, and it's a subheading. And now we got regular non-capitalized serif body. You can see it creates hierarchy. So this is where my attention is drawn at the heading. Subheading gives me some more context to the heading. And then the body copy is here, legible, easy to read. It's not stylistic, it's just easy to read, okay? We can also go something like this. I'm using three fonts here. Now, you can do this really poorly. I'd like to think that this is a nicely done um, combination and pairing, but it gets more sophisticated. It's kind of like you got red wine, you bring in some fish and some cheese. Pretty nice. You got some white wine. There's your heading. You got blue cheese, subheading, wait for it. Coffee grinds with a little bit of honey. I'm getting a little crazy here. I just did four fonts in a food platter, but it works. Try it, trust me. So in this case, I kind of did something like that. Let's talk about alignment. Everyone knows alignment, left, center, right alignment. Seems simple, right? Well, guess what? A lot of people don't realize that, that when it comes to alignment, things can get messy, things can get hairy, and you can make really bad choices. Here are some rules of thumb. For headings, keep, when in doubt, just left align. When in doubt, left align. Center can get really hairy. Don't center your body copy if you're reading like paragraph style text. So let's just, for example, let's just use this for example. So I got justified alignment here. You've heard of justified when it just spans the full page. Uh, it could be, um, I, I, I wouldn't recommend doing this. You might want to do justified uh, alignment in like a newspaper or magazine. That's kind of standard. And you'd have like to split up the line length of the line. You might want to have columns and that works. It visually looks pretty good. Okay. But you probably want to do something more along the lines of this. So I'm going to create a duplicate here. So here's an example. We got a center heading. That works fine. You know what, like I said, when in doubt, left align. So watch this, let's left align that heading. It looks great, but let's center align the heading. That works fine, especially if the heading doesn't span more than, if it's just one line, a couple words, you know, a product, um, you know, a name with just a, a couple words, great. A heading that has lots of words and it's more of a sentence and it's got a couple lines, uh, center could get a little bit messy, but it still works. Text, left align your body copy, your paragraph text specifically, subheadings, and your if your headline is, is centered, subheadlines can be centered as well. It works. Body copy, where it's more of a paragraph, left align that every time. Unless it's a stylistic choice or it actually works for some reason, which, uh, unlikely, left align. Why? We read, well, most people read left to right, okay? So when we read left to, right, left to right, we have an anchor. I don't know if that's the actual word, but you anchor yourself at the left, okay? And I'm reading along the line here, okay? now. This, this actually, the, the line length here is too, too long, in my opinion. I'll get to that in a moment, what line length is. But for now, just bear with me here. Left align paragraph text. So I'm reading left to right. Okay, when I'm done reading this first line, where, am I, where's my, where does my eye want to go? Back to that anchor on the left side. It's aligned at the left just after the margin here. So there we go. I'm reading this line. Boom, back to the anchor. Boom, back to the anchor. It's just easier on your eyes. Okay. And you want that. It just creates a better legibility, readability, user experience, especially on screens. Your eye wants to fall back to the anchor. Okay. Something, you know, like this, your eyes would probably look something like this. Right. Perfect example. Perfect example. So you want to left align that body copy because there's a lot to read and to make it easier to digest, easier to read. And especially if you're doing marketing copy, sales copy, and you want that person to read, 
so that you can compel them to buy your thing, then you don't want them to get annoyed and strain their eyes trying to read your stupid center aligned sales text. Now, here's an example of why centered is not good. Do not center your, your text in terms of body copy. In some cases it works. In this big chunk of text, it does not work. There's multiple lines. And like I said, your eye wants to anchor here. But here's the problem. If I were to draw a line here, there's my line. You can see, let's call this line the anchor. So my eye starts here. And as it comes back around, you can see the next word here is starting to get a little bit. Let's see if I can zoom in on it for you. Just have a look at this. Now it's not on the anchor. Now that's not so bad, but it might create some visual dissonance. But here, the word since, definitely. Look at the space here that my eye needs to travel. When it comes back from that long line, you want it to fall back to baseline, fall back to the anchor. But it's not going to. It has to look a little bit further. Okay, oh, you're sneaking around on me here. And then, okay, now there's my baseline again. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. Boom. Whoa, make is a little bit further to the left. And then into is closer to the anchor again. And then, whoa, 1960s, we're going way over here now. And then the word more, we're way over off of the, off of the anchor. And that's a problem. For, and look at this, versions. Look how far versions is. Like your eye doesn't, it's going to strain itself and it's actually going to create visual dissonance. And there's probably a psychological impact that it's having on the person. Probably at worst, it's making them not like you and not know why. But you're making people dislike you because of your choice of center aligned text. Probably there are studies to back me up on this. But for now, just take my word on it. I know that if I'm reading a site, let's say apple.com, and we center align their text where it shouldn't be, it's not going to look good. You know what? I'm going on a little tangent here, and I'm going to prove to you exactly the, my point. So hold on here. Now look at this. Gorgeous website, epic contrast here, and it's all about selling their Mac, their MacBook Air or the MacBook Pro, all the different Mac computers, okay? Very seductive, very high-end looking, but just take a look here. Their heading, what can we see? This is a sans serif font, and it is center aligned. Their call to action is center aligned here. That works. Center, center, center. That works. Let's move down. We got left text, right image. This is left aligned. Now, there's not a lot of text for me to read here, but new, fall back to anchor, MacBook Air, fall back to anchor, power, uh, fall back to anchor, the price, fall back to anchor, buy. Now, if I were to center align this, let me just center align this. So I'm just going to play around with their font. Uh, let's see, letter spacing. Okay, they've got some typography here. I can actually play with their typography and show you. So their line height, we're getting into line height, letter spacing, kerning, and all that stuff in just a moment. But I'll show you here. Let me just tech, uh, text a line. We're going to center it. Let's see if that worked. Okay, that didn't work. Maybe it's on this, actually. Text a line, center. They're not letting me because uh, I'll just override that. Man. Whoever is working on Apple doesn't want people messing with their... Now, granted, I'm not actually messing with their website. I'm just playing with the inspector, which you can do on any website. I'm not actually changing Apple's website. All right, so I'm actually going to their product copy column here. So that whole container, and I'm actually going to center it there. So there we go. Take a look at this. It doesn't have the same impact. It creates this weird V shape. There's actually a lot of lines. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines for me to read, even though there's not a lot of text to read. It's a lot of lines. And then I'm the, the anchor is not there anymore. And it's just, it just creates visual dissonance. Some people might think, Hey, that looks good. Usually that's a rookie, um, <laughs> rookie opinion. I remember thinking center aligned, everything looked good, but it really doesn't. It creates dissonance. It creates stress. It actually doesn't look good. And if you were to center align everything on the site and take a look at it versus what, what it should be, which is a, a a balance of center aligned headings and left aligned text, it's going to be a much nicer experience. And you probably could see studies. Again, I'm just citing all these studies that I don't know exist or not, but I went to design school. Okay. 
All the design instructors told me this. And in my experience, left aligned text, especially when there's lots of lines to read, it just makes more sense and it's better visually and it creates less stress and it's easier to read, okay? So I'm looking here now, I center align that. It just, it doesn't have the same impact. Okay, if I were to switch that back, you can see, let me see if I can just like toggle that for you real quick. Center aligned, just looks a little sloppy. Left aligned, it's got some power there. Now this 13 inch model actually, there we go, I fixed it. So everything's left aligned now. But again, if I were to just toggle that, it just, it doesn't have the same impact. Now, what if I were to just look at this? Left align, left align, left align. A lot of data and information for me to, to, to read here. If this were center aligned, it would just be a mess. So for example, let's turn the text align. Right now it's left and now it's centered. It, it's just, it's just not right. It's too many, too many anchors to like, it's just your, your eye wants to follow the line that you established the anchor from the first word. And when you read left to right, we don't read center out, center out, center out, or in some cultures top down, we're reading left to right. So if you're reading left to right, you want to have the same starting point. It's like you're doing laps. You want to lap at the same point every single time. Okay. So that text line center is just messing with me. Okay. Center here works. It's a heading with a subheading. It works. They could have left aligned it, but they probably chose to do this to create some visual interest. This works, three lines, they're just headings. This works. All right, so that's my example. I just wanna, I was on a little bit of a, <laughs> everything center aligned here because I think I accidentally turned uh, center line everything on. I'm pretty sure that they didn't do that by choice. I'm just having a look here. Now let me just refresh and just see. All right, so yeah, now these sections, interestingly enough, trying to make a hypocrite out of me, there's a lot of text here that's center aligned. I'm not necessarily sure it was the right choice, but then again, this is Apple and they spend a lot of money on designers. They're known for their design. So maybe center aligned in these cases, it can work, but I will rest, rest assured, they spent a lot of time thinking about if this should be center aligned. I'm just, I'm assuming that. Now, if I were to make that left aligned, uh, it might actually work. But with that said, let's use one more example here. The footer, lots of footer text, lots of, you know, footnotes. This is left aligned. I don't know who actually reads all this stuff, but there's a lot of information to take in here and it's clearly has to be left aligned so that you can read it properly. If this were to be center aligned, it would look really, really messy. It would be hard to read. And you'd think that they did that on purpose to make it so to discourage you from reading the footnotes. So if I actually like text aligned left and I made sure that that happened. You can see there that that's just a mess. That's like, look at the, look at this. And so there's a perfect example. When I highlight the cursor, imagine that that's your, your anchor where you start reading. You see how it moves. This, that's where your eyes have to keep like jumping around. And that's just, that is not easy to read versus it just standard being left aligned like that much better. Now digression, let's go back to, let's go back here. So that's my rule of thumb. Your headings can be centered, subheadings centered. If you're doing large body text, paragraph text, don't center it, left align it. And definitely don't right align it, unless you're using it in an example where you would have, let's say, an image on the right, text on the left, and you wanted the text to be justified to the right. So it kind of creates this interesting look in between the image and the text. But again, there are exceptions to every rule and it's not like you're going to fail at web design if you make certain choices that are against the rules. That's totally fine. But when in doubt, left align, once you start going out into the center, things can get hairy. Okay. Um, so that's my example there. Here's justified alignment. As you could see, I could very much just left align these and it would still have the same effect. 
But if you want to have create that clean gutter in between, and that's a word that you learned in a previous lesson, that's a gutter right in between here. So you see this in magazines, uh, in print. And the reason why you do these two columns is to create visual interest, but also because the, le the line length from, from the beginning of the sentence all the way to the other side of the page, depending on the font size, it can be hard to read. So let's, let's use another example here. All right, so let's take a look at line length. You could see in this example, it's the length of the line that you have to read. So in this line, the width of the space that the, that the sentence needs to take up and the font size is kind of what creates your line length and if it's legible, or if it's too long, or if it's too short, or if it's just right. So in this case, the line length is too long. So the font, it's either the font size is too small, so it's creating too many words per line. So that's, you have to follow this. And it's a lot, you know when people have to put their finger on like letters and words in a book to be able to follow it? That means that they either have bad eyes or the line length is too long. You know, when you have to use a ruler to follow it, it should be natural and easy for you to follow. So in this case, there's too many words in this line. You might end up, especially if you're in like line four, five, or 10, and you just can't see where you are anymore. You get lost. So that's too long. It's too hard to read. That's, that line length is too, too much. Now, this line length is too little. That's too short. There's like two words per line. And then your eyes are going to get tired because you're like, and it's too too hard, too hard to read. Plus, you're just going to have this really like vertically long um tall body copy and it's just gonna, it's not going to work. This is better. You see the font size to the width of the page, it works. And you might experiment. There's probably a ratio to this like width divided by whatever, but I don't know. Uh, it's usually just um, and maybe designers out there, if you already, if you know this answer, if there's an actual ratio, put that in the comments, cause that'd be cool. But you could just kind of tell if I were to make this font size small, like let's do 20 points, that's too long. If I were to do like a hundred, obviously that's, that's a mess. If I were to do like 40, that's better. Might be still a little too much. 60, let's go to 50. That works. That works really well. Okay. So that's line length. Now next, all right, next up is line height, also known as letting. In the web design world, it's just called line height. No like web designer coding up a site calls it letting. That's graphic designers. That's, that's like designers, people who are like type designers, you know, foundries who create fonts and typefaces. They use words like letting. You'll see it in things like Photoshop, um, Adobe Illustrator, you know, thing, tools like that, you'll see letting, you know, for example, let me just show you in Photoshop here. So if you were to go to the character styles, you can actually see, oh, I'm not showing my screen. Here's Photoshop. I don't know if you could see this, but here's like a font. So this here, here are your choices. So this right here is letting, and that would be the space, vertical space between each line of your text. And it's usually calculated in percentages, but it can be decimals, M, RAM, pixels, or points. It's uh, usually um, in body copy, the, the percentage that you'd want to stick around is like 100% to 130. It works well for readability. I'll show you that. And for headings, 80 to 100%. You don't want too much letting or line height in headings, especially if it's multiple line headings. It's just hard to read, okay? The whole point of this is to make it easier to read and to make it a better experience. And sometimes to create contrast and visual impact or branding. So back to Photoshop just for a quick sec. So that's letting. And if I had multiple lines, um, that's not two lines, that's three lines. So heading with three lines. So the letting here is actually a little too much. There's too much. You see how that's kind of hard to read. I'd probably do something like the letting and I would, you can actually change it here to like, that's too little, maybe something like, you can actually just drag this here. So maybe something like, oh, I gotta do the whole thing. Let's go back to, uh, let's go to 60 pixels. Now see here in Photoshop, I'm seeing pixels. I'm not seeing percentages. So I don't, not really sure how to calculate in percentages. I just do it visually. Uh, but if you're designing, if you change like your units, your measurements of your units, you can actually do that in Photoshop. You might want that to be percentages, uh, but you can actually see here, like this is too little because the ascender 
is starting to like mash up with everything and it just doesn't look right. And then auto, I don't know what that was, but it was too much. It's too, too much letting or line height. So I'd probably do something more like probably 150, something like that. In this case, if the font size was larger or smaller then that would change. Okay. So that's letting. Now body copy, let me just show you an example here. So here's the line height or letting. This is body copy. This is 80% line height, 100% line height, and then 120. 120, a little bit much, 80, too tight. You want enough space in between so it's easier to read. If it's too tight, then the words start to mash up together. If it's too too tall, then it's just it's like your eyes have to jump lines and it and you don't know if it's a new paragraph or you don't know if it's a new line or if it's the same chunk of text. So that would be that would be your letting for body copy and headings. Here's headings. This le this letting is too tight. 60% line height. It's too tight. This bottom one is too much. The line height is 140 and the middle is 80% and that that letting for that heading looks great. Okay? Letter spacing, it's the spacing between groups of letters, okay? Um, and then kerning is the spacing between two characters. And I'm gonna show you that. Let me show you actual visual examples of that. So this is a primary headline and a subheading. Um, tra tra tracking is another word. Let me just give you a little graphic I put together here. So tracking is not necessarily the line length, but it's actually the space in between each letter on a full line. So here we go, typography anatomy. So the kerning is the space in between two letters. Okay, and some designers like to fiddle with the kerning between specific letters. So if I'm in Photoshop, kerning would be like, if I thought this was too tight, I can go here to kerning. I could change it here to metrics or optical. I don't know the difference, doesn't matter. But I can actually set the kerning between two characters. So you see how there's a lot of space in between the H and the E, that's kerning. And then I'm gonna make it really tight. You might think like, why would I ever do this? It's because some fonts, the kerning out the gate might have like too much space in between letters like that. You make, oh, that needs some kerning. So I'm going to change that. Now in web design, you're really not going to do much with that. You're just going to, you're not going to just individually choose letter spacing in between the kerning. It's, it's unlikely you're going to do that unless it's a specific design choice. What you're probably going to play with is the tracking or also known as letter spacing. So if I'm going back to like the internet here and I go to like, um, let's go to fontshop.com and let's see an example here. Let's just choose a font. Actually, there's just too much going on here. Back to the trusty old Apple. Everybody knows this site. Let's just check this out. So in their headings, they're tracking. In, in the web design world, you're usually going to call that letter spacing. Um, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, letter spacing. I don't know if you could see this here. This is called letter spacing, and they're going negative 0.015 Ms. I'm not going to get into how you measure that unit of measurement, but let's do like 10 pixels. So there's 10 pixels between each letter and you can see it spaced it out. It doesn't quite look right. You know, let's go even more, 20 pixels. Let's do tons of tracking or letter spacing. That is very hard to read. Now, if I were to do the opposite and make it like negative 50 pixels, all the words are gonna just jam into one another and that's gonna be hard to read as well. So let's do something like negative 10. So that's really tight, not good. Let's make it negative three. That's a little better, but still a little tight. I think they had something more along the lines of, you know, negative two or negative three, probably negative two letter spacing for their headings. You wouldn't do that for body copy. You keep the body copy natural. So the body copy that they have here in their subheadings, you wouldn't really want to have the letter spacing too tight together or too far to get, uh, too far apart. The letter spacing they have here is actually a positive number. So it's 0 0.011 M probably more like one pixel or less than a pixel, like 0 0.0, like 0.5 pixels. They're using M's, which is a different unit of measurement, but I'm just going to go with pixels for now. So like five pixels apart, hard to read. 
negative five pixels, like you can't, it's not even readable. Negative two, negative one, it's just too tight. Hard to read, something like 0.5 pixels. That's a little bit easier to read. So that's how you'd use that on the web in a more practical sense. Kerning, like I said, is the space between individual characters. Letting is the space vertically in between lines. Tracking or letter spacing is the is the full uh, the groups of letters. Here's a logo that we all probably know, the Nintendo Switch. So the tracking for the word Nintendo is actually pretty wide. There's more space in between each letter, whereas Switch, same font, same typeface, uh, it's sans serif font, all capitals. But in order for it to fill up the full space, almost like you're doing like justified alignment, the tracking for Nintendo is wider, whereas Switch, the, the tracking is closer. And in between individual letters is the kerning, okay? So that's how that would look in kind of practical sense. Now, fonts and context, just as a quick little exercise, different fonts work in different scenarios. So you don't want certain fonts um, that don't match up with say a visual or a vibe or a brand. So for example, let's use this as an example here. Here's an image I got from unsplash.com. It's like kind of more medieval style art. Birmingham Museums Trust, Birmingham, UK. That font, it's too silly and playful and bubbly wubbly for that style of, of art. You'd probably choose something more like this. Birmingham Museums Trust, this is a all caps, serif style font. And then same thing down in, but to create contrast and hierarchy, it's lower, lower case and, and um, smaller font size. Here's a picture of Van Gogh, a picture of a painting of Van Gogh. Bubbly wubbly, I think this is Comic Sans and it's like weird light gray. It just doesn't work. It's, it's, it doesn't work. We switch it. Now we got something different. This conveys something different than that. Now you might want to go for something like that if you're creating kind of like a caricature or you have a silly website or, or you have got more something more playful. You probably never want to use this font, all caps, but different folks, different strokes. There's an example, Van Gogh painting. Got some resources, fontshop.com, a list apart. Uh, I'll link this all up in the description below. You can check these things out. You can play around with the fonts in your page editors, in Webflow, in Photoshop, Adobe XD, whatever tool you're using to change fonts, it's all there. Now, if you're using something more sophisticated like Photoshop, you're gonna be able to adjust kerning, letter spacing, line height, tracking, all that stuff. You can even do it in you know Apple Pages and Keynote. You can go to Format, it's all here. Like if you go to your, click on a body of text, you can actually change the character styles. You could change the spacing, the lines, the, the, the line height. You could change the uh, tracking in between. Like there's, you can do lots of stuff here. Um, but in Photoshop, you would play around with it in your character settings here in this character pane. You could do that. Um, but I'm gonna link some things up in the, in the description below so you could check those things out. Now, if you're just building something on the web, I always tell my students, don't get too fancy with your fonts. Like if you got an Adobe Creative Cloud membership, you got access to lots of fonts. Um, but that might not be a good thing because not every, like you might have a really bad combination of fonts. When in doubt, go to systemfontstack.com and just use the system fonts bit baked into the browser. It's usually a uh, sans serif, like so for example, on my Mac, I have a different system font than if you have a PC but they're usually good fonts. They work, they're system fonts built into the machine and quick loading time and take out the guesswork of fonts. If you don't wanna get into the font game right now, if you just want a decent readable site, you got a sans serif font here, a serif font and a monospace font. And you can just, it's simple, it's easy to read. There's your code if you're using CSS, use that as your font family, it looks fine. Okay, so when in doubt, when you're building a website, just use the system fonts. Uh, don't get too crazy and too fancy. But hopefully this lesson on typography, a history of it, the little you know bibs and bobs of, of fonts and type, the anatomy of type, hopefully these things you found interesting, you found helpful, 
Things like pairing and combinations, hierarchy, contrast. You know, you wouldn't pair a Guinness with, you know, maybe like a light fruitcake. It might not work. Maybe it does. I don't think it does. You probably don't want to pair red wine with bacon and eggs. Uh, kind of, I don't know how that would work. Just the same as you wouldn't want to have a specific font, a large block style display heading with like bold Comic Sans body copy, all caps, centered with terrible tracking and kerning in between each letter. It would be a mess and no one would take you seriously. So hopefully you found this lesson on typography good, interesting, wonderful, special, the best. If you found it to be any of the above or all of the above, click like, share, comment, ding the bell, ring-a-ding it all day long, and we will be seeing you soon in another lesson, free web design lesson by me, Brad Hussey, right here on my YouTube channel, The Art, Business, and Craft of Web Design. Until then, you're awesome, and go out there and make some beautiful type.